Good evening, everybody. It's wonderful to see you all today at Wan Kuangsa Temple. It's great to have such a large Sangha from various countries. What I want to talk about is the middle way, one of the most important concepts in Mahayana Buddhism. In the old days, they didn't have very, very extreme karma like we do right now. Mother Earth was not in such a danger as she is right now. 7.7 .7 billion human beings was unimaginable 2,500 years ago. In fact, by scientific estimates, in the Buddha's time, there was between 100 and 150 million human beings on Earth. In Jesus' time, 200, 250. And then 1 billion was hit about 200 years ago. When the Buddha talked about samsara and nirvana, people's experience was very different. Life was stressful, sometimes dangerous, you had to work really hard, there were wars, it's true. But resources and space, these things that do not talk, they were much more plentiful. It was not a problem to get firewood, you know, or to get clean water. And if it was good times, then producing food was actually quite predictable. What was samsara at that time? Everybody lived and died, maybe shorter lives, but in the Buddha's time, ascetics, yogis, they lived very long lives. So samsara had a very different understanding than now. There were no zeros and ones, no internet, no information age, not such a fast-paced, information-loaded life. Nirvana also had something really interesting. It wasn't just peace. It was like not having to be born. Samsara was the constant or perpetual life and death cycle, which most sentient beings cannot leave because of their attachments. Now, if we just get a little rest, oh, that's nirvana, that's fantastic. So after the Buddha's time, a few hundred years pass and new phenomena begin to appear. Buddhism develops and tens of millions of people begin to practice that and have their own understanding of nirvana and samsara. They took things to the extreme very quickly because practice gave them very good path to awakening, to extinction, to have no dualistic desire, anger, and ignorance. And then there were super ascetics, the Hinayana hermits, also later the Taoist hermits, that really took things seriously. They lived a very correct life. They woke up, nirvana. So there were sentient beings, like everyday people, who supported monks and nuns and gave a lot of energy for these folks to attain awakening. What was the relationship between the two? As society developed, more and more human beings lived at higher and higher standards. Monks and nuns became more and more proficient in their, in their practice. The distance, the gap between monastic and lay got bigger and larger. And then some concerns emerged. Let's say you support a sunim or a bante or a lama for a long time and you're a layperson. And then you are told that you get merit that's the good result after supporting somebody working for nirvana. But in the old doctrine, you stayed in samsara, being born life after life after life after, unless you cut your hair, become monk or a nun, then you take the high road, you know, towards enlightenment. Monks and nuns gave up everything, lived a very simple life, but they went into the sunset and never returned. So the distance between those of us who stay here and those who leave and never return just got bigger, bigger, and bigger. And people began to ask questions. If I support you, you attain something, I stay in samsara, you go into nirvana, so how does that really work? And then came, instead of the concept of the arahan, the purified one, the never returner, Another concept called Bodhisattva. Whatever awakening a human being attains is used to save another human being from suffering. And give it another few hundred years, and 14 generations after the Buddha with Nagarjuna, the great philosophy of the Middle Way was born. So it's called the Madhyamaka, the philosophy of the Middle Way. In it, there's something that was really not said before, that samsara and nirvana have the same substance. That's why on your precepts paper, 
you read holy and unholy are empty names. It's on everybody's five precept paper in a poem by Zen master Sung San. And then something really began to connect in people's minds and lives. In Theravada, you read three important marks of existence. Impermanence, imperfection, interdependence. In Mahayana, you have something more. The interpenetration of all phenomena. Originally, phenomena have no characteristics. These characteristics are created by mind alone. And then something interesting began to appear and we started to return to mind as the central concept and not nirvana as the final goal. You're gone. What do you make right now? Do you make samsara? Do you make nirvana? If you don't make anything, then everything is clear just like this. And especially in Chan, Son or Zen Buddhism, there's a concept called suchness or thusness, that things are just like this. The sky is just blue. The trees are just green. And this thusness or suchness is the foundation of the middle path or middle way. When you look at the 10 ox herding pictures, you see how the cycle goes from picture 1 to 10, sometimes 11, and then feeds back to the first. Because when the master approaches the city, then picture 1 appears, the student. And that student is looking for the prince of the ox. If you look at similar imagery of Hindu or Indian Tibetan style practice, you find something very interesting. There is a picture with a white elephant and black monkeys and a very winding path from bottom to top. Bottom right, there is the family home. And when you leave that, your nature and your karma begin to fight. White elephant and black monkeys and little devils and temptations and whatnot. And then you have to take this winding path, hairpin after hairpin, conquering your own hindrances. And then you reach Tushita heaven, the top of the picture. But between Tushita heaven and the family home, there's no relationship. There is no returning. In Mahayana, especially in Zen, when we say wake up and save all beings from suffering, the two are actually closely linked. One does not work without the other. How is it possible that you disappear into the sunset of eternal bliss and Tushita heaven and your friends and family are suffering on this planet? And that's why the middle way means Mahayana. Mahayana means we practice for all beings. So monks and nuns, they go up to the mountain. And then after some time, they come down to the valley and they start to help and teach other people. And that's why lay people who can manage their lives in such a way that they find time to practice, they begin to improve their own quality of life. Another central concept of Mahayana and Zen is Buddha nature. Actually, we don't know what that really is, but it works beautifully because this is the only thing that is really identical. Our bodies are different. Our thinking, our emotions, our speech, our actions, our soul also different. Our true nature is the only thing that is beyond this. If you say same, mistake. Different, also mistake. If something has no name, no form, how can it be same or different? But when we give basic instructions, we can say our Buddha nature is the same. It's not a bad thing to say that. So Buddha nature sounds very good. Potentially, we are all Buddhas. Wonderful. But it also means that it's your job to wake up. Nobody can wake up for you. Nobody can take away your karma that you made, only you. We have this wonderful, because, oh, I can get enlightenment. Yeah, clean your room. Yeah, you can do that. So freedom and responsibility in this way, in fact, in all Asian views, they come together. Causality and created by mind alone, all together. In the West, we like to separate the two. I do whatever I want. Nearly 30 years ago, when this country was changing into something supposedly better, there were many interesting scenes in the beginning time of democracy. Nobody understood really what democracy and freedom were. So somebody started to smoke in a shop, in a supermarket, although it was very clear that it's forbidden to smoke there. You know, somebody asked him, say, why are you smoking? It's not correct. It's forbidden. He said, there's democracy. There's freedom. I do whatever I want. Then so somebody came up to him, took the cigarette out of his mouth, and he shoved it in his face a little bit. And he said, what, what are you doing? Why are you so violent to me? 
Then the other guy said very calmly, you said there's freedom, I do whatever I want. So this is very interesting concept and uh, this uh, limited or childish concept of freedom is very dangerous. But responsibility is also something we have to clarify. Because sometimes people feel that they themselves as an individual, they are responsible for the whole karma of 7.7 .7 billion human beings. That yeah. I am the reason why this world is so bad. So if I sacrifice myself somewhere, then everything disappears and everything will be better without me. This is also a completely ignorant view. So you should see what you are doing with your own body and mind, how it affects others, how they react to it. What is their primary karma, their responsibility, their freedom? What is your primary karma, your responsibility, your freedom and how these two connect? When you see that, you can really distinguish clearly. So your Wisdom to see sky is blue, trees are green, your job, my job, this wisdom is very clear. But you also perceive your substance, my substance, all being substance, same substance. So when you are really on the middle way, then everything becomes very tasty, very quality oriented. And you see things and people for what and who they truly are. So life is not just samsara, nirvana, black and white good and bad, me and the rest of the world. No, you see it much, much more refined. And this moment is the treasure house of everything. Just now you can attain the middle way. Just now you can see things as they are. Just now you can connect to people and see for who they are. And that's when our path appears. That's when our direction appears. So whether you hold the steering wheel of your car or not, it goes through space and time, so you better get to the steering wheel and get some sensible control. Time and space and causality, they do not wait for you. So either we grow up, we become mentally adults, or we start to blame this world for our own unfinished karma. Your choice. Don't think it's insignificant. You are very important as an individual. What kind of mind quality do you have? What kind of life do we live together? This direction can determine a whole community. That community can have an effect onto a larger community, etc., etc., etc. If you practice long term, you can see the effect on your family and surroundings, how it works. Some people cannot tolerate that you are practicing the Dharma because it makes them change. Without you directly inciting or wanting any kind of change, just because you are connected, that changes them. In the Oriental Wisdom, they say somebody becomes monk or nun, the merit affects seven layers of relatives immediately. Maybe it's a little bit far-fetched, but I can personally verify seeing my family, other monks and nuns' families, that it works like that because our hearts are connected by our karma. And if you practice the Dharma, that spreads through this channel. So you do not have to explain yourself or convince people of what you're doing as Zen practice. Live a clear, observable, simple life and help other people naturally, including your family, friends, maybe even your adversaries. And then something interesting begins to take effect is the spontaneous function of the Dharma. I cannot describe it any better. It starts to affect people. And then we start to really realize what it means to live on this planet. So do not underestimate your own individual practice. Do it. Perceive cause and effect. And be inspired by success and failure. So if you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask. Okay, in my practice, I feel that I miss something or I lack something. Also, during listening to your talk, when I try to understand the English, I always feel that I miss something. Also in the Kogan practice as well. So can you comment about it? It just takes more practice uh, to figure out what you're missing. If you feel that something is incomplete, it's actually a very healthy feeling. Imagine that you start a six course Shabbat dinner and after the second you feel full. <laughs> it's very unfortunate. If you are full with the falafel and the trina, no, no space for the halva, okay? <laughs> Steve Jobs used to say, stay hungry, stay foolish. 
So stay hungry, we all understand. But what, it, what does it really mean, stay foolish? He didn't mean go crazy or become dysfunctional. It's undetermined in my book or in Zen speech, keep don't know, keep your mind open. Do things that are really not just expected of you, but something that appears in your heart spontaneously. So this lacking feeling is perfectly okay. It shows there's more work to do. Welcome to the club. <laughs> How does the self-defensive mechanism works in dream state of the mind? So dream state is very interesting because that's more mysterious for us, everyday people, than a normal daytime reality. In order to understand how this works, you need to get the structure of body and mind together from Compass of Zen, and most of you already understand that. To be brief, you have eyes, ears, nose, tongue, and body as touch, first five physical senses. And then you have something interesting, the sixth is related to your brain, it's your conceptual engine, that's where you form concepts. So the conceptual mind actually creates this word microphone and actually attaches it to this form here. The seventh is the discriminating consciousness. That's when good and bad appears. In fact, that's where your I appears first. And whatever your seventh consciousness labels as good or bad, me or not me, gets stored in the eighth consciousness, which is your memory, long and short term. So if you attach any dualistic category to any phenomena, it becomes your memory. Some schools say that whatever you see, whatever you hear, goes directly into your memory and you cannot take it out. Not true, we would die very soon. So what is it that gets into your alaya, your eighth consciousness? How does that work? Whatever is labeled by the seventh, with any dualistic label, that becomes part of your personality. Conscious or subconscious, then it goes into your alaya, your memory. The sixth makes the concept and puts name and form together. The seventh assigns polarity to it, positive or negative, including the identification. And then it gets to the eighth as part of your psyche. Okay? When we dream, the sixth is inactive. And anything below that is on standby. Your physical senses, you can be woken if somebody pushes you, screams into your ears, but the first five is standing by because you are asleep and it's kind of in low power mode. The seventh and the eighth together, it's your dream body, okay? It can function inside the physical body or outside. And whatever practice you do, I am doing mantra, Kwanza Bosa, Kwanza Bosa, also goes into your alaya, also works with the seventh consciousness. So to be clear, we do this practice in a very, very simple way. We do not occupy the first six levels of consciousness, especially the first five. We keep it totally vacant and clear. We do not block the senses. The sixth is consciously kept busy by your question or your mantra, or if you're clear enough and you can switch it off, then the sounds, the space can take out the activity of the thought forming or concept forming sixth consciousness. In this way, you do not assign labels immediately. You do not make analyses. You do not jump to logical conclusions because your meditation actually stops you in that. But your seventh and eighth, they are still very active. That's why if you process something during meditation, it doesn't come back in a dream state. Reverse, if it comes in a dream state, you didn't process it in your wakeful meditation time. If you have a bad dream, your own dinosaurs are chasing you and want to eat you, okay? And you're a good Zen student, so you know, you don't run, you don't fight, you stop, you look, and you don't follow the mind's reaction, just keep and the same thing can work in a dream state if your practice went deep enough. Because all this practice actually goes into our subconscious and really cleans up the archetypes, the past, the present, the future. Did you know your future is also in your subconscious? Watch out.
So during your dream, if something really extreme appears, your meditation practice has already taught you some drill, some kind of discipline. Return to your practice, don't follow the mind. When this happens in a dream state, there are two outcomes. You wake up or your dream continues undisturbed. And some of that you may remember because you pat yourself on the shoulder. Oh, very good. <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> Because the next bigger dinosaur comes. Don't do that. If you wake up, then you had to wake up. And when you remember a dream, especially a recurring dream, then it's important to look at it with the question, what is this? So originally, this question, what is this, means you attain your true nature. Sitting, standing, walking, lying down, in silence, in speech, dream state, or being awake in the body, outside the body, being born or dying, constantly without interruption. What is this? Now you can use this awareness. If you can keep this, man, this is really something. You can use this awareness to focus on an object of the mind and see the cause and effect relationships. And in a dream state, it can be the difference between a very, very sweaty and bad and binding dream or liberation and understanding and insight. So keep your practice. That's all. If you know you are going through some rough stuff, you can do some bows before going to sleep and hold on to your mantra, like your kind of security, you know, rope, and uh, then go to sleep. Sometimes when people are very disturbed and they are about to go to sleep, another person asks them, do you want to take all this into your dream state? So chill out, relax, clear your mind while you are conscious, then bail and go to dreamland. Don't be afraid of death, it's coming. Don't worry about that. Rather, look at yourself. Is this the way you want to pass on? Is this the soul you want to put to your next body? Hello. Keep going. I have two questions. The first one, when I ask, what is this? What am I supposed to do after that? Ask again. When I say, when I ask myself, when something comes up. I understood your question. I already answered it. So what should you do after ask you again. ask, what is this? Ask again. <laughs> <laughs> With every in-breath, you can ask this question. And when your mind is really in the groove, you can... Make it to every other in-breath. And a couple of months or maybe a year of practicing, and then you can, don't look at me like that. <laughs> you can be so familiar with this that the mind actually doesn't need to use the words of the question, but the question is there. So when you say practice, uh, or when you process something in a meditation, you mean keep asking, what is this, what is this? And that's the only process you need. Everything else is spontaneously done by six, seven, and eight consciousness. That's all. Don't touch it with the sixth. Sixth is your thinking mind. Okay? That's where your cleverness, analytic, and synthetic, and other processes are. And we want to put things right with our thinking. We can't. In fact, thinking made the mess. So cut off thinking, return to your substance, stay in your tanjon. Let the upper three major chakras spontaneously empty out. That's cleansing. And ask the question again and again and again. That's your refuge inside. Okay? And the other question is uh, about relationship between teacher and student. Terrible. <laughs> <laughs> student tries to learn. Teacher tries to teach. That's terrible. <laughs> but... <laughs> I would like to ask about uh, double teachers and uh, the end of the relationship. I'm not answering it. That's how it ends. If I answer your question, the relationship never ends. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, commitment is the key word. Out of that comes loyalty and uh, practicing in the same space and attaining the mind that uh, the great Buddhas and patriarchs followed. Teacher and student, how are they different? Teacher must be ahead of you 
quite a few years and understand you better than you understand yourself. Plus have the motivation to really teach and help you. True teacher leaves your autonomy but puts light at your karma from an angle you would never see it. That's why it's so disarming. Sometimes it's very painful. But you see and you say thank you. Then you become more adult and the teacher never takes your homework, never takes your freedom and then the student can grow. In fact, if you grow, you get more responsibilities and more tasks. That's how you know that the teacher acknowledges your progress. Then there is some respect soon, which is earned, not commanded. And what's very important that at some point the teacher acknowledges the student's maturity and young teacher appears. In Zen, it takes a lot of effort because we don't talk about thinking or learning or just reading books. Attain. Practice and attain. And that will manifest very clearly and spontaneously. And then you will be in the position to help all beings. Teacher-student relationship, it never ends. But in the meantime, the student becomes a teacher. And new student appears. I have a situation in my life that repeats again and again, and I don't know how to see the cause and effect of this situation, and I don't know if I want to change how to see the cause and effect and how to change it. You have a blind spot. You say there's a situation which repeats, and you also say you don't understand cause and effect. You don't understand the cause, yes. but then how do you see that it repeats? You recognize the repetition, you also recognize cause and effect. Okay. Okay. Without recognizing the cause and effect to some extent, you wouldn't even recognize that it's repeating itself. Mm -hmm. So, in other words, what is it in the process that you do not want to see? Maybe it's something unpleasant. Maybe it's something that would mean you have to change your own view of yourself. And uh, it can be painful, I know. But, uh, we have a faith in the, in the path. And we want to make the path more wide or clear to other people. And also some people sometimes have difficulty to understand the path. Also we have the faith that it can help them. So he asked how together we can make the path more accessible or clear or wider to other people. You already understand this. We cleared the question in the interview room today. Do you remember that? What was that? What he remember is the uh, believe in the way and understand the way. Yeah, that's okay as a description. But how we act, how we speak, that's very direct, okay? And I help you with that, just like I help everyone in this room, that if you want to make the path available, accessible, wider, inclusive, you need only one question. What is that? How may I help you? That's all. People will respond. Zen is wonderful because we teach by example, we teach by way of life, we teach directly, we don't have to convince, we don't have to explain. It's much more simple than people think. You inspire people, come on. We already talked about it. Just keep, keep doing what you're doing. People will be naturally attracted to the qualities that you represent. And you don't even have to ask. They say, Please tell me how you are doing this, you know, that's all. And then you get to their territory because they invited you. And then they open up, and they say, okay, I have this and this problem. You're 84. How do you manage, you know, to live like this? I say, well, you're one quarter of my age, but let me tell you something. It's not that bad. <laughs> it's not that bad. <laughs> Use the practice and use your good karma, you know, to help other people. Still not satisfied from the result. Never will be. That's good. <laughs> stay hungry, stay foolish. Answer those people's questions, respond to their inquiries, and 
wake up their own Buddha nature. See where the freedom is, see where the responsibility is, and start to play this tango of teacher and student. This is very interesting how it works. He said, I tell you what to do. This is not us, okay? So this is very interesting how you explain certain things and then you don't let them be satisfied. First of all, uh, thank you for having us here. It's very, very pleasant to be here. Thank you for coming. And uh, thank you. Um, I wanted to ask, I'm new in practicing who am I in meditation. And um, I feel that uh, it's like a mantra. It has no... Uh, I, I feel that it's difficult for me to keep an open spirit to let this question stay or have an effect on me. Just like saying it on and on. Then change it, because in this way you can become a Zen robot. <laughs> I don't want to be a Zen robot. You won't be. I can promise that. You're much more alive than that. So with who am I, you can practice that, but soon it becomes like this self-contained cycle and it becomes kind of boring. There are two problems with who am I, the who and the I. Everything else is okay. <laughs> and that's why we use what is this, because it really opens you up. There is no avatar or person sitting on top of Mount Sumeru, okay? The who is already a product. The I is an avatar, it's a personality made of something or things. What is this actually bypasses that problem and leads you back to your substance. And what is this? The question, it really opens you up and it keeps all your senses all your channels totally open, but you are not attached to it. You're not identifying with it. You do not have any dualistic relationship to it, okay? Don't use the question like a robot. Use the question like a practitioner. Uh, I want to say thanks also, of course. You're welcome. For the sangha today in the, in the room about uh, my job in the world. And I, I feel that the most difficult things for, thing for me is to stay with the question. Very similar, I think, maybe not with Nurit. To stay with the question and um, to rely on the process, maybe. And to be patient, right? Of course, maybe Good. it's the first thing. Why is it difficult? <laughs> How heavy is the question? Big. How big? Give me the size. Very. Measure it. Measure it for me. It's, it's, it's actually uh, defining define myself. What is my job? It's very big for me. Can you bring it here? The question? Yes. No. It's so big it cannot fit into this room? Um, Don't make anything. You make the question big, your problem. Originally, no question. We use it as a tool to open up the door of our consciousness. That's all. Yeah, I understand your words, but how do I do it? You don't attach to your ideas, then you really understand my words. Do it. All other reactions, associations, put them all down. How do you know that you get the right answer? Because the right answer does not move from the question. It's like a good relationship. How do you know you found the love of your life? Because he does not move from your side, mm -hmm. you do not move from his side. Mm -hmm. Boom. You belong, whatever happens, you belong together. In this case, you ask the question, the answer comes and goes. Another answer comes and goes. Then a thousand times happens and once Answer, poof, clicks, and mm -hmm. then it stays. Mm -hmm. And you keep asking the question without any judgment, without any willpower. Just keep asking. No change. There. Then you can trust that. What is compassion? How may I help you? <laughs> Just that? Not enough. Not enough? Sorry. Dog runs after the gold. 
Compassion is not just emotion. It's really the readiness to help, but based on your perception of the other person's mind and situation. So it's not what people say they want, it's what they don't even say, but they need. And uh, compassion means you really attain another person's heart and mind and situation. That's where it begins. So oneness is the root of compassion and not just some rosy emotion that it will be so wonderful when I help you from your misery. And right away there is the guns, you know, from the truck, you know, no way. <laughs> Compassion is, I think, the most important human relationship. Attain each other's situation, attain each other's mind, try to help each other and see the reflection, how it comes back and not expecting any good result in the short run, maybe long term. But this oneness is actually the root of trust also. When someone feels you really understand them, you really perceive them, and you don't do anything, not yet, that's inciting natural trust. That's how it goes through. You cannot be compassionate with someone who doesn't trust you. It doesn't go through. So don't move, just perceive. Attain the other person's mind. And there's this unspoken relationship, and that's the root. And emotions not yet appeared. You didn't even say a word. Not thinking, not acting. Just stay in this moment of oneness. You know how powerful this can be? They sit in the same room with you and they just begin to cry. Because they feel so mellow. So much melt inside. It can happen like that. And then you can use that correctly. Correctly using this is a huge responsibility because the Dalai Lama said, I have a good news and a bad news. Which one first? Okay, so, sir, please, good news. With loving kindness and compassion, you can achieve anything. Ah, this is wonderful. So now you said bad news, so please tell me the bad news. He said, with loving kindness and compassion, you can achieve anything. <laughs> Be careful. So I want to thank you all for coming here, joining us from a great distance space-wise, but no distance mind-wise, and sharing this time with us. It's wonderful to have all of you here and practice together. And I sincerely hope that our cooperation goes on, involves more and more people, empowers more and more people in the, in the Dharma. Because we can see, we don't have to believe, we can see that our practice makes this world a better place. It helps us clear our own minds and, and actually help each other live a very, very clear, compassionate life with wisdom and correct action. So thank you very much. <laughs>